Hello, everyone. We're going to start in one minute. Um, again, if you have not had a chance to fill out the lobby poll, please do that. Okay. I want to welcome everyone to the second of our two-part series, The Intersection of Substance Abuse Use Disorders, Opioid Misuse, Overdose, and Suicide. Um, we will have um, several speakers today, so um, we're happy that you're all here. Um, again, this is our, this is part two. Both of these will be on our website in a couple of weeks along with um, links or handouts, um, so you can just check back. Um, today's format, this webinar will be recorded and available, um, and it will be, I apologize, it will be on the Great Lakes PTTC website. Um, the audio is broadcast through your computer speakers, so make sure that they are turned on and up. We will not be having a call-in number. Um, and feel free to use the chat box throughout the webinar to ask questions or add comments. We will be having a Q&A section, so um, you can feel free to type in a question and we will save it for the uh, Q&A session. Um, today's presenters are um, Kristen Quinlan and Nicole Tyrone. Um, Dr. Quinlan is the lead epidemiologist for the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, where she provides recommendations on using suicide-related data for planning, quality improvement, and or impact purposes. Dr. Quinlan is also the director of the Outreach Corps for the Injury Control Research Center for Suicide Prevention, where she is responsible for translating the latest suicide prevention research into practice. Dr. Quinlan also coordinates and evaluates outreach efforts for the TRANSFORM project for child maltreatment and prevention. Nicole Perron is a licensed clinical social worker in Massachusetts who works as a senior project associate for the for Health and Behavior Health Initiatives at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center at EDC. Her role includes providing consultation to behavioral health organizations, states, emergency departments, and primary care providers that are implementing safer suicide care protocols, such as the Zero Suicide Framework, as well as developing resources for staff and external audiences related to the intersection of substance misuse and suicide. Additionally, she's worked on suicide risk assessment curriculum to train clinicians who work in substance use disorder treatment settings, virtual trainings on suicide risk assessment, and motivating individuals to engage with treatment, and led virtual events and presentations on the overlaps between opioid misuse and suicide risk. Prior to working at the SPRC, Nicole has worked in crisis intervention, substance use disorder treatment, and jail diversion programs. As a jail diversion clinician, Nicole led a community-based opioid task force that included representation from public safety, schools, peer specialists, and healthcare organizations. We are excited to have both of them on our webinar today. Um, the objectives for our webinar this morning are to describe the unique relationship between opioid misuse, opioid use disorder, and suicide. We are going to identify key characteristics, including risk factors for subpopulations that are most affected by this issue, including those affected by chronic pain. And we are going to define action steps, health systems, and communities and individuals can take to support people at risk for opioid misuse, opioid use disorder, and suicide. So with all of that being said, I am going to turn it over to Nicole. Great. Thank you so much, Anne, for that introduction and um, for welcoming us today. Um, I really appreciate that. 
So what I'd like to see now is um, whether there's any other questions you folks in the audience would like to see answered today. Um, knowing what Anne just presented in terms of objectives, I'm inviting you to share with us in the chat box here anything that's on your mind or anything that you were hoping to um, hear about today in this webinar. Um, so while you're typing those in, um, just want to remind you, as Anne said, we'll pull um, any questions that you submit together for our Q&A section at the end of the webinar. And so um, you know, we'll make sure to address those questions then. So I see a few people are typing. Um, you know, I think what we'll do is we'll keep moving along just to make sure we're um, getting into all of the great content that we have today. And um, we will be sure to address some of your questions and reflections here in the chat as we move along today. Um, so at this point, um, I'm going to dive in and get started, turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Kristen Quinlan, to share with us some details around the overlap of suicide and opioids. And then I'll check back in with you after this section to get some of your reflections in the chat. Great, thank you, Nicole, and hello, everyone. Um, so I was just checking out the chat um, while Nicole was talking. It looks like um, some folks are hoping for some summaries um, on the uh, information that was presented last time. Um, again, the uh, information uh, from that webinar will be presented um, on the PTTC uh, web website, um, so you'll be able to access it there. Um, also, I'll be doing some summaries um, as you go along. Some of the information will look uh, familiar, and then we'll kind of expand on it. So you know, hopefully, if you didn't get a chance to attend or listen to the last webinar, you'll be able to kind of catch up this time um, because I'll kind of scatter in some summaries throughout as well. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is the complex relationship uh, between suicide and opioid misuse and overdose. Um, we started to introduce it in part one, and, and here's where we're really going to dig in. Um, so as I mentioned uh, when I did part one, I am kind of an epidemiologist, sort of researcher, kind of numbers girl. Um, so there will be some parts of the presentation that are a little bit number heavy, um, but I am going to be moving quickly to application um, because this is really my passion as well. I know that the, that's what you folks are here to listen to is, you know, really understanding you know, what these numbers mean uh, for you folks on the ground um, as you're doing your prevention efforts, um, and that's where I want to move to pretty quickly as well. Um, but I do think those numbers are important because they really help uh, make the case for prevention. Um, they really help us to kind of direct our prevention efforts um, and really understand where those uh, shared risk and protective factors lie. Um, also, as we move through the numbers, um, I want to just, you know, again, take a moment to, to really be cognizant of what those numbers represent. Um, I know that, you know, for every opioid death, every suicide on um, there's a family and an individual and a community that are impacted um, and I want to you know just make make certain that you know folks know as we kind of move through these and as we present those numbers uh, that we're really cognizant of that you know of that relationship um, so what we're going to be doing first is just digging into some of the numbers on opioid abuse um, as we see on this slide, we have 11.8 million people over the age of 12 um, who abused opioids um, in, in 2016 in, in a single year. Um, if we look at the big giant green circle, we see that most people who are abusing opioids are abusing prescription opioids. So about 97% of all people who abuse opioids are abusing prescription opioids. And these are the, the opioids that you find in, in medicine cabinets really across the country. Um, it's not usually heroin that folks are using. It's not usually heroin plus prescription drugs. It's really, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of focus on those prescription opioids. And what this does is kind of prevent, uh, point us to some prevention opportunities. So if most of the opioid abuse is happening with prescription drugs, we have this really, um, I think, good space to start to think about how how we can control it uh, through prescriber education, through media campaigns on safe storage, through safe opioid disposal strategies. At the same time, I want to recognize that um, substance abuse prevention, and, and those of you in the field are going to be very, very aware of this, it's, it's almost like a game of whack-a-mole, you know, sort of as you control one area, it kind of pops up in, in other areas, and, and that, that seems to happen. So, you know, there's a, there's a concern that if we make prescription opioids harder to obtain, we might see an increase in heroin and non-prescription opioids like fentanyl and, and that sort of thing. Um, and this sort of whack-a-mole problem kind of points to the fact that our prevention strategies can be targeted, but they also need to be really comprehensive. Um, prescriber education and safe opioid disposal strategies alone are not going to solve the prescription drug crisis. 
Um, what we need is a full toolbox of strategies so that way we can make sure that as we prevent one substance, we're not, um, you know, kind of encouraging folks to simply turn to another. All right, and here's where we start to explore the link between prescription uh, pain medicine, um, depression, and suicide. Uh, what you'll see on this slide is percentages going up along the side, um, and those percentages are uh, the percent of those people who've used prescription pain medicine in the past year. Um, there's three different groupings along the bottom. Overalls in blue, major depressive disorder is in yellow, and serious thoughts of suicide is in orange. Um, so even if we just look at this epi data, we, we kind of see start to see that connection between uh, prescription drug abuse and, and suicidal behaviors. We see that overall about 35% of the population has used prescription pain relievers in the past year. For those people who have major depressive disorder or thoughts of suicide, this number is higher. We see over 50% of those with major depressive disorder or serious thoughts of suicide have used prescription pain relievers in the past year. So this kind of general population uh, data really gives us some idea of the connection between prescription pain medicine and suicide and major depressive disorder. But I want to point out that this um, chart here is actually just exploring prescription drug use, um, not necessarily misuse, not necessarily abuse. Um, so these data don't really tell us whether those who are depressed or in crisis are misusing prescription pain medicine. It only tells us that they're using prescription pain medicine. So this points to a question that we're going to point, we're going to um, kind of try to explore a little later on the webinar, which is, you know, is there a relationship between physical pain, opioid use, and, and suicide or major depressive disorder? And again, we'll just kind of explore that as we go uh, through the webinar today. Uh, this next slide shows us some data from the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey, um, the YRBSS. This is a middle school, high school um, survey that's administered biannually. Um, and uh, this particular slide here is showing us the percentage of students in grades 9 through 12 who reported attempting suicide in the past year by lifetime prescription drug use. Um, so the percentage of students is along the side, and then those, those distinctions between folks who have and have not um, abused prescription drugs drugs in the past uh, are in their lifetime are in the in the green boxes. And so um, what we're seeing here is a pattern. We're seeing that uh, if we compare those with no history of prescription drug abuse with those who have a history of prescription drug abuse, um, those who have abused prescription drugs are at higher risk for suicidal thoughts. Those green bars are higher every single year. And I imagine that if we went back prior to 2009, we would see that as well. We would see that, you know, this kind of relationship has sort of persisted over time. Um, that folks who have who've abused prescription drugs in their lifetime are also more likely to have had serious thoughts of, of suicide or have attempted suicide um, in the past year. All right, and so some of this uh, information, um, if you attended part one of the series, is, is going to look kind of familiar to you. So I'll do a quick, quick recap on some of it. We can delve in a little deeper, too. Um, I'm really presenting uh, some of it again because it's really some of the best research we have on the link between opioids and suicide. That connection and, and the exploration of that connection is really still a new field, and so the research is still kind of building on what we know about the link between opioids and um, suicide. Um, so why I like to turn to the research literature um, as opposed to kind of the epi data which we just covered is because the, ep the research literature lets us explore some of the nuances of the relationship between opioids. And, and suicide. It helps us answer questions about whether the dose or the frequency of opioid use impacts its relationship to suicide and, and other kind of complicated questions like this. Um, so if we look at the research literature, we see a couple of things. We see adults who receive high doses of opioids are at increased risk for suicide. Um, and the relationship here is looking at uh, veterans patients, uh, patients from, from the VA specifically. Um, this connection, this relationship between higher doses of opioids and increased risk of suicide holds true even after controlling for demographic and clinical risk factors. So the relationship between higher doses of opioids and increased risk of suicide is still true regardless of the demographics of the patient, regardless of the patient's clinical presentation. Um, another thing that came up in the last presentation that I wanted to kind of 
touch back on um, is folks asked, you know, what does a high dose mean? What is a high dose of prescription opioids? Um, in the case of this research, uh, Mark Elgin and his colleagues, uh, they calculated a standard maximum dose and kind of classified it on this one to five scale. So, you know, one is a very low dose, two is like kind of, you know, starting to creep up there and, and so on and so forth. Um, in order to get to a five um, as a high dose, it was, it was 50 to 100 milligrams per day. And what Mark and his colleagues found is that um, as dosing increases, risk increases. So as folks moved, moved from a one on that scale to a two, to a three, to a four, et cetera, they, they, were, they found their risk of suicide increased, you know, kind of as the prescription drug um, dose increased. So that, that relationship was there. Um, we also see that adults who abuse opioids weekly or more are more likely to engage in suicide planning and attempts. Um, and this is true even after we control for things like depression, demographics, other psychiatric conditions. And finally on this slide, we see um, the results of a meta-analysis, which is a, um, a study that combines the results of a whole bunch of different studies together um, to, to really get at a sense of what the effect is in, in the population, what the, what the true effect size is of, uh, of a relationship, the true strength of a relationship. And that meta-analysis found that adults who have an opioid use disorder are 13 times more likely to die by suicide than the general population. And what all of these bullets have in common, all three of these bullets, um, is that the degree of opioid involvement matters. People who abuse opioids more frequently, who use higher doses, or who have an opioid use disorder appear to be at particularly high suicide risk. And so now I'm going to turn it to Nicole so she can talk a little bit about the implications for practice. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, I just want to take a step back for a moment and provide some space for you all to take a moment and type into the chat here one key takeaway from this section. And um, while you're doing that, I'll just kind of see if we can sum up a bit from this section. So um, as you can see, we're talking about a really complex issue here with opioids and suicide. And so what does that mean for practice? We talked a lot in the first webinar of this series about the importance of looking at local data and comparing it to state and national data in order to prioritize where to focus prevention efforts in your community. And so here we dig into that with a little more specificity. So things like looking at method of suicide and presence of opioids specifically in suicide attempts and death. So let's see here what folks are mentioning in the chat here. So I see a comment, the association between overdose and high dose makes sense, but relating suicide to dose without also connecting to severity of chronic pain begs the question of the relationship of suicide to the latter. That's a great point, and we're going to actually talk a bit more about um, chronic pain as we're moving along here, and we can kind of tease that out a bit. Um, seeing people mentioning opioids are a high risk factor and that um, being a good takeaway. And um, just so everyone knows, I, I do see a couple questions in here. We, you will have access to the PowerPoints, and um, you know, once those are available, we'll be sure to let people know. Um, so you know, you'll be able to have access to that as well. OK, so we're talking about data. So how do we find some of this data? Um, I'm going to turn it back now to Kristen so that she can walk us through how to use some of the existing data sources that are out there. Great. Thanks, Nicole. And thanks again for those comments in the chat. Um, John, I particularly liked the one that, um, that Nicole had pointed out about, you know, sort of relating suicide to dose and the, and the um, severity of chronic pain, right? Because opioid use, especially high doses of opioids, are important, um, you know, a, a, a piece of connecting, of, of kind of controlling pain for folks who, who experience chronic pain. So we definitely want to get back to that in a little bit. Um, and I thought that was a really great point. Um, so we definitely want to um, touch on some of the points that are coming up in the chat. Really appreciate the things that you've all brought up so far. Um, so I want to talk next about data sources. Um, and I think I think data sources are important because data is really it's useful for informing our prevention efforts. 
Um, I'm going to breeze over this slide here only because it's kind of an at-a-glance uh, vision of, you know, the kinds of data that you can get from different national data sources. Um, and I'll be breezing over this in favor of really, like, kind of picking these out and showing you the kinds of data that you can get from each of these sources, because uh, I think that that might be a little more, a little more useful. But um, this at-a-glance chart is kind of useful just to show the fact that, you know, each data source has information on opioid abuse, um, suicide, and suicide attempts in, in some combination. Um, and so they, they all have their utility, um, and they, they all have a, a space, I think, for really recognizing that connection between suicide and, and opioids. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit more in just a second. Um, I'm going to start with the first one on that list, which is the um, Whiskers. Uh, it's the Web-Based Injury Statistics Query and Reporting System, which is a mouthful. That's why we call it Whiskers. Um, it's a CDC's uh, interactive online system. Um, and what it does is it allows the user to manipulate the information that they want to see on fatal um, and non-fatal injuries, um, so that way they can kind of, you know, drill down a little bit and understand more about, you know, where the problem lies. Um, so what we've done here is we've really taken a screenshot on, fat on uh, fatal injury data, um, and this fatal injury data draws on death certificate data that comes in uh, throughout the nation. Um, what we see here, and I'm going to use, I'm hopefully going to use this little green arrow, um, good. Uh, so what we see here is um, when we go to that interactive website, what I've clicked on is uh, deaths by suicide specifically. So I sorted um, for deaths by suicide. And what the system does then is spit back um, to you the number of um, folks who've died by suicide. So we see about 47,000 uh, folks have died by suicide in 2017. Um, and we also see an age-adjusted uh, rate. It will also kind of give that back to you. Um, so we see 14 per 100,000 uh, folks have died by suicide in the last year. Um, Nicole has put the uh, Whiskers um, website um, in the chat box, um, so you can kind of see for yourself this interactive system that you can use uh, to draw data on um, deaths by suicide and other types of injury. Um, the other thing I've done here on this screenshot is I sorted by a mechanism of death, and so that gives us the ability to um, to sort by, uh, you know, different mechanisms. So we can see the percentage of suicides that were firearm-related or suffocation-related, or specifically where I want to draw your attention is, you know, drug poisoning and non-drug poisoning, so these kind of poisoning um, areas, which is where we'd find our, our opioids and, and those kinds of connections. Um, and so, you know, that's another thing that's useful with the Whiskers uh, website is it really allows you to, to start to explore uh, the relationship between drug poisoning um, and suicide using epidemiological data. Um, what we also have is the National Violent Death Reporting System. This is uh, called NVDRS. Um, it's also available through the same Whiskers uh, website. Um, Nicole has also put the uh, more specific link uh, up there on in the chat so you can, you can explore that when you get a chance. Um, what it does is it provides details on the circumstances surrounding uh, deaths. So it collects information from death certificate data, but also from medical examiner records, police records, coroner reports, um, those kinds of things to really create a comprehensive picture of the circumstances surrounding a death um, by suicide. Um, not all states are up and running with the NVDRS system yet, um, but they're all funded, um, so they're all getting there. Um, and so in a couple of years, we anticipate having some, some really good uh, representative data um, from NVDRS. Right now it's a little more spotty. Um, some states are better than others about, you know, recording here. Um, some states, uh, their recording systems are a little more complete than others. Um, and so we're hoping that, you know, as we continue to sort of refine this system, we'll have a better understanding of the circumstances surrounding deaths by, you know, opioids. And, um, and suicide. Um, so what we have here in this blue box is a whole series of circumstances uh, surrounding um, the deaths of, of folks who have died by suicide. Um, and part of this is, and it's super small, so my apologies, um, alcohol dependence um, is, is one of the circumstances uh, surrounding suicide. Um, we've also got uh, substance abuse problems on there. Again, this just shows us that national data sources can look jointly at suicide and opioid abuse and overdose. And so, you know, there are spaces in these national data sets to, to really start to do that. Um, so those are um, the, the two that I just covered, Whiskers um, and the NVDRS, um, are drawing on death data. Um, but we also have nationally representative surveys that give us some information about attempt data um, and also about substance misuse um, that's going on um, from year to year. Um, some of the 
best sources for that would be uh, the NISDA, um, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. Um, it's a publicly available data set. It offers information on opioid misuse and suicide ideation um, for adults with some uh, limited use data. It's not as, not as comprehensive uh, with the use data as it is for the adult system. Um, so the NISDA is, is useful for that purpose. Um, we also have the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System, YRBSS. It's administered biannually. It goes from uh, grades uh, six, so, so, so from middle school all the way through high school, um, and it asks youth about you know, opioid misuse, suicide ideation, and suicide attempts, and so it gives us some information on, um, on youth risk behaviors. Um, both of these systems, um, the YRBS particularly, has like an online portal that will allow you to um, either download the data yourself so you can analyze it using SP, um, SPSS or some similar, uh, you know, statistical program. Um, or uh, NISDA has some pre-made tables and they've, they've analyzed the data in a variety of different ways using a variety of different cross tabs so you can look at the relationship between, you know, certain variables and other variables is a very comprehensive report that's available, available from the NISDA. Um, and Nicole has uh, helpfully um, put the um, links to those surveys um, in the chat as well, so you can explore those um, as we as we move forward. Um, the other one that I wanted to cover is Essence, which is, which is the electronic surveillance system for the early notification of community-based epidemics, another mouthful. Uh, this is uh, CDC's uh, Biosense platform. It's a, it's a platform that was originally developed to monitor bioterrorism, but now it just it receives data from 44 states, about 51% of U.S. emergency departments participate, and what they do is they provide information on uh, chief complaints of, of uh, patients who've come in. And the system then takes that chief complaint data and organizes it according to different types of injury. So it gives us a real-time sense of what's happening on the ground. You know, we can look for uh, spikes in suicides or spikes in opioid overdoses in real time, um, as opposed to some of the other uh, systems that I just presented on. Those systems, they, they take some time um, to, you know, kind of clean their data and get them ready for, for the public to use. Um, Essence system is, is much more real-time, gives you a little bit more of a real-time sense of, of what's happening. The tricky part is, is that, you know, like I said, it's not completely representative. It's not in all states. It's not in all emergency departments. Um, so it, for those reasons, it can be a little tricky. Um, it's also, you know, you need to know the right people, I think, in your health department in order to, to access this information. Um, but again, it's useful because it captures real-time information on both substance misuse and suicide-related behaviors uh, through this system. Um, and I'm seeing a question uh, actually come in from, from Marissa um, asking about how these larger data sets can be narrowed uh, to the local or tribal level. Um, unfortunately, at this time, the big national data sets are really sorted um, so you can pull out uh, experiences, you know, either, either through death or through, um, you know, through like MVDRS or YRBSS um, by, you know, Native American, Alaskan Native uh, populations, but there's no way to really narrow it down by tribe. Um, for that information, you would need to go to probably the tribe itself. Um, and it, we, spoke, we spoke last time during the last webinar about some of the challenges inherent in trying to uh, collect data on um, Native American, Alaska Native uh, tribes, um, particularly with regard to, you know, sometimes there are social factors like, um, you know, the, the term suicide might be outside of the, the real cultural lexicon of the tribe. And so they may not be recording it in a way that is similar or, you know, kind of speaks to, uh, for comparability purposes, um, you know, other populations, it, it might be hard to, to compare or it might be hard to gather um, because, you know, um, understandably there are kind of trust issues with regard to letting that data out, um, and so, so that, can be, that can be an issue as well. Um, so we would need to work with the state um, on this, um, but particularly I think you need to work with the tribe on this and you need to have a champion within that tribe um, who is, you know, really interested and invested in, in collecting that data and can help you kind of navigate those, you know, sort of cultural pitfalls and, and make sure that you're, you know, you're asking about this information in a way that is, you know, culturally competent and sensitive and, you know, in the way that's going to make the tribe uh, comfortable. Uh, so now I'm actually going to turn it over to Nicole uh, to talk about an example from the field. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. And um, everyone, please keep the great questions and, and comments coming here in the chat. Um, you know, I'd love to hear from you maybe uh, a key takeaway you have from this section or, um, you know, even better, how you might take this info and use it 
um, definitely hearing some themes again around collaboration and you know making sure you're connected to the right people. Um, and we did talk a bit about some resources related to collaboration in the first webinar of the series. Um, so you know I hope if you haven't um, checked that out once the recording is available um, that you will take a look. Um, so while people are typing here in the chat, I'm just going to share um, an example with you of how the overlap between opioids and suicide is being addressed in Kentucky. Um, so in Kentucky, in addition to having some standardized crime scene tools, they're also thinking very strategically about connecting people who overdose and end up at the emergency room with a peer support recovery specialist um, who also happens to be trained in suicide prevention specific kind of um, evidence-based programs. And you know, we know that not everyone who overdoses ends up calling 911, but I think that this example specifically highlights how um, someone can access more services and why it's so important to think strategically about what we can do and, and how we can do some of that cross-collaboration. Um, you know, I mentioned in the chat earlier, it was great seeing um, in the lobby poll results earlier that so many people who have um, experience in either substance use disorder prevention or treatment have also done some cross-collaboration with substance use, uh, excuse me, with suicide prevention practitioners. Um, and so in this particular case with Kentucky, this uh, collaboration has really helped the state think about how to improve accuracy in suicide and opioid overdose data. And they've thought about how they can address suicide risk and overdose risk simultaneously. And that's also incredibly important, right? So if you have peer support recovery specialists in your emergency rooms and you're able to link them with some resources for suicide prevention, that really helps to um, collaborate and start some interventions at that community level. Um, OK, so uh, I see people are still kind of typing in the chat. Um, so you know, I'll give you some time to put your reflections in. And we can go back to those maybe at the end of the next section. Um, but for now, I'm going to keep us moving here and turn it back over to Kristen to walk us through what we know about um, some risk factors and opioid misuse and suicide. Sure, and before I do that, I actually just wanted to turn to another question that had come up in the uh, in the chat, um, and was kind of related to the Kentucky example, um, sort of um, in that you know somebody had typed in that they'd be curious to learn more about uh, successfully working with uh, the medical examiner at the local level to determine accidental versus intentional opioid-related deaths, um, and you know that's something that we covered a, a little bit in uh, part one, uh, in that you know we talked about how. Um, when the medical examiner or the coroner, uh, depending on what state you live in and what system you have going on, um, when they uh, code a death, they have to determine intent. And that intent question um, helps them determine if a death by uh, drug overdose is uh, accidental or if it is a suicide. And we found that there is some bias um, with regard to medical examiners and coroners and how they're classifying deaths um, you know, with certain types of, of individuals um, being more likely to be classified as undetermined intent or as a, an accidental overdose. Um, over a suicide. We talked about how this matters because you know we use data for um, to inform our suicide and, and other types of prevention efforts. And if the data aren't exactly accurate, it can you know kind of misdirect our efforts a little bit. Or you know if we're trying to use them for evaluation purposes and and they're not exactly standardized, it can be really difficult for us to determine whether or not a program or, or a, an intervention that we're doing is working. Um, and so I think you know there's a couple of really good resources out there uh, to help folks. Um, as they as they kind of do the stance, as they work with the medical examiner and they work with their coroner systems to really help improve the accuracy of the data that is, that are collected, um, the CDC. Um, is working actually on a, or has been working historically on a, um, a support tool um, for medical examiners and coroners. Um, Deb Stone over at the CDC is, is, uh, is kind of taking on that space. Um, and she is, what they're doing is trying to figure out if there's a way to really help medical examiners and coroners, you know, really classify a, a death more accurately um, when, they're on the, when they're on the ground there, because it, be, it can be hard. Um, it can be particularly hard for, I think, coroner systems, where um, they may, may or may not be medically trained, um, and there is not usually or, or, you know, sometimes there's not a requirement for any kind of ongoing training, and so when something like the opioid crisis pops up, you know, the, the coroner 
systems are, are overtaxed and, uh, you know, and they don't have the resources or the training to really, you know, to kind of figure out um, how, to, how to classify deaths in these kind of nuanced ways. Um, and so, you know, it's really useful to have some tools uh, that, that can help. Um, the CDC is one of those places that, that is working on that. Um, so uh, what I want to do now is I want to turn to opioid misuse and suicide, talk a little bit about what we know about risk. Um, the last webinar we talked a little bit about shared risk and protective factors, and I want to cover those in more detail in, in this webinar. I think, you know, the more we know about risk and protective factors, the, the better we're going to be at um, coordinating our prevention efforts. And I'm, I'm really invested in this idea of coordinating um, prevention efforts because I think, you know, it's, it's really economical for a field that's that's often underfunded. Um, suicide prevention, for sure, is, has been historically underfunded. Uh, substance misuse prevention as well. Um, and so, you know, when we can join our, our, our efforts, when we're both working, you know, when both fields are working upstream to really, you know, build those protective factors that are shared uh, between those two public health problems, I think that that's a big bonus. Um, and it's also impactful. Uh, we know that coordinated public health efforts work. Um, we've seen them work in other fields, and, and I really believe, and, and we have evidence to show, that it can work here too, um, that if we combine the uh, efforts of opioid misuse prevention and suicide prevention together, uh, we, can, we, can make some, we can make some impact. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about that. All right, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to talk about two different things. I'm going to talk about the risk factors for opioid abuse, um, and then I'm going to talk about the risk factors um, for suicide. And then what we'll do is just explore the um, overlap between the two of them so we can really get at those shared risk factors in, in some detail. So I want to turn first to the factors that increase the risk of opioid abuse. Um, and the, what you see here on the screen is, is not a complete list. It's a sampling of some of the known risk factors for opioid abuse and overdose. So it's not, you know, not an exhaustive list uh, by any stretch. Um, I want to highlight a couple of them, um, starting with physical health problems and pain. Uh, pain patients may be at higher risk for opioid abuse and dependence, and this is particularly true if there's a history of trauma or a prior history of substance abuse. So pain patients with a trauma history or with a substance abuse history are at ha even higher risk of opioid abuse. Um, I also want to pull out uh, social isolation as a risk factor. Um, rural environments, which we often think of as a proxy for social isolation, have been associated with prescription opioid misuse, uh, particularly for white adolescents living in these kind of rural areas. I also want to flag trauma as a risk factor. Uh, trauma, if we think about you know, child abuse, neglect, um, that's been directly associated with the risk of prescription opioid misuse. Um, and most of the data that's been done has really looked at adverse childhood experiences and youth, kind of followed them over time. And you see that you know, it, it increases their risk for opioid abuse uh, later on in early adulthood. I also want to flag um, behavioral health problems as a risk factor for opioid abuse. Uh, depression and anxiety are very well-studied risk factors for opioid abuse. Uh, the connection has been found both children, adults, kind of across populations. We see uh, that behavioral health problems increase your risk for opioid abuse um, for sure. Um, but I don't want to, you know, kind of leave this slide or, or, or I really want to just highlight the, the um, idea that there's a difference between causation and correlation. The factors that, are, that I've just listed, that I've just gone through, um, really increase the risk of opioid abuse, but they don't guarantee it. So even if a person were to have every single risk factor on this slide, um, it doesn't mean that they will abuse opioids. Um, and opioid abuse isn't necessarily caused by any one of these factors. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, these factors can even interplay with one another. Uh, so, you know, there are some complicated uh, relationships going on here. Um, so I just want to kind of underscore that fact that we're not talking causation here, we're talking about just general risk. Um, Suicide, um, we see some of the well-known factors associated with suicide here on this slide. Again, again, this isn't a complete list, it's just a sampling. Um, if you're looking for a, a really nice summary on the risk factors associated with suicide, um, you may want to turn to the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention, which is a, a really great uh, source of information on uh, suicide risk factors um, and prevention. I want to talk first about physical health problems and pain. Uh, cancers, degenerative diseases of the central nervous system, so things like Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis, uh, traumatic injury and central nervous dis system disorders like epilepsy are all associated with uh, increased suicide risk. Chronic pain conditions, we'll talk a little bit more about um, in a minute or two, but uh, chronic pain conditions like headache and back pain um, are also associated with suicide risk. 
behavioral health problems, um, depression, anxiety, a history of substance use disorders, um, all of these are associated with an increased risk of suicide. Um, I want to highlight uh, social isolation as a pretty well-established uh, risk factor for suicide, particularly for adolescents. Uh, kids who identify themselves as having fewer than one friend are at higher risk for attempting suicide. I want to turn to trauma, um, both in terms of adverse childhood experiences, but also in terms of historical trauma. So um, adverse childhood experiences are associated um, with an increased risk for suicide attempts, um, but uh, historical trauma seems to be associated with future suicide risk as well. So Native American, Alaska Native populations, uh, we see, and, and we saw actually in the last webinar, um, a, a chart on um, showing that, that those folks are at higher risk for suicide, um, and, and historical trauma may play a role there. We've seen some convincing research that, that kind of leads us to, to believe that, that that's, an, that's an area. Um, and again, I want to underscore this uh, correlation causation issue. Um, so the factors on this slide are associated with an increased risk for suicide, but um, again, if, even if a person were to have every single risk factor on this slide, it does not mean that you know they will die by suicide or that they will have attempted suicide. Um, these are associations. They have complex relationships with suicide, and they have complex relationships with one another. Um, so if we think about the two slides we just explored, um, we can see that there are some commonalities between those factors that place people at risk for opioid misuse and those factors that place people at risk for suicide. Specifically, we saw that physical health problems, behavioral health problems, trauma, adverse childhood experiences, and social isolation, um, sometimes defined as rural living, uh, can increase the risk for both opioid abuse and suicidality, so there's this intersection there. And we can think about how that intersection might play out in some of our target populations. So if we work with adolescents, for example, those kids at risk might be those who are socially isolated, um, those who have a trauma history. You know, those kids might be at risk for both suicide um, and opioid um, misuse. So it might be important to start to think about how we can direct our prevention efforts uh, specifically toward those adolescents. If we think about service members and veterans, uh, likely at risk are veterans who are socially isolated, um, those who have combat histories, uh, those who have injuries um, resulting from some cr um, from chronic pain. So you know the the trauma there, um, you know the social isolation that comes with uh, discharge from the military, um, both honorably and dishonorably discharged. Um, those you know that can be that can be a big issue um, because you know that's a that's a real social connection there. And so times of transition within the military um, seem to be a risk factor. So transition out of the military, for example. Um, so we want to think about, you know, social isolation, um, chronic pain, and, and um, combat histories um, and when we think about, you know, working with that target population. If we think about older adults, um, those likely at risk are those who are socially isolated, uh, those in chronic pain, uh, maybe those with behavioral health issues. Um, so when we're targeting older adults, we might want to think about targeting our efforts uh, to, towards folks who share those risk factors. Um, the men in the middle years are, are also a very important population to uh, to start to think about. Um, men in the middle years being at risk for both opioid abuse, um, overdose, and um, suicide. Um, again, those at risk are, are likely those who have depression or anxiety, um, those in chronic pain, uh, those who've experienced social isolation. So men who are maybe going through some transitions like, say, unemployment, um, recently unemployed or recently divorced, um, things that lead to social isolation. Um, these men may be at risk, um, and so we may want to think about targeting our prevention efforts accordingly. So I said before, you know, when I was talking about the risk factors between um, opioids and suicide and, and, um, and the risk factors that are associated with each one of those that, you know, they're, they're complicated relationships and the relationship between opioid and suicide is similarly complicated. Um, it's really challenging to, to really understand, you know, what exactly is, is kind of contributing to this link. Um, it could be that higher doses of opioids offer increased access to lethal means. So maybe people who use opioids are more likely to die by suicide because they have access to some kind of method of suicide. Maybe opioids have a disinhibiting effect. So maybe because of these, there's some increased likelihood that people, people will act on their suicidal impulses. Maybe there's some characteristic like pain or depression that's associated with both suicide and opioid abuse. I think any of these um, hypotheses or even some combination of these hypotheses is entirely possible. 
But the take home point here is that the relationship between opioid abuse and suicide is complicated. And the real why and how mechanisms that explain that relationship are not well understood. I said earlier that this uh, field is, is fairly new, that, that you know, understanding that relationship between opioid and suicide um, is new. Um, and so there's not, not a ton of research really explaining this sort of causality. You know, what's, what's happening here? How, is the, how are these two linked? Um, and we're still learning a lot about it. Um, and I think that, you know, circling back to that data point, you know, when we talked about how uh, the data on overdose um, and, and suicide is kind of messy and that, you know, uh, coroners and medical examiners have to really determine intent when they're, when they're differentiating between a, a suicide in an opioid um, overdose, you know, it kind of uh, part of part of our problem in sort of disentangling these, you know, kind of leads back to some of the data issues that we're struggling with as well. So when it comes to preventing opioid abuse and suicide, we have a bunch of good options. Um, and the three really, three really good options are here on this slide. Um, we could address shared risk factors. So we talked about what some of those are, social isolation, uh, physical pain, uh, behavioral health problems. We could look for programs that address both of those kinds of shared risk factors. We could also focus on populations at increased risk. Um, so we know, for example, that the veterans are at increased risk um, of opioid abuse and suicide. Maybe we focus our prevention efforts there. Or maybe we select strategies that address both outcomes. So there are some, out, um, some strategies that are um, out there in the literature that have proven uh, positive effects on both um, opioid misuse and on suicide. And so, you know, that's another place that we could start to think about directing our prevention efforts. Uh, here are some examples, I think, hold on, I think that's going to pop up in animation, yes. Great. Um, so, you know, if we think about addressing shared risk and protective factors, um, there are home visiting programs that can reduce the impact of trauma and adverse childhood experiences. And we mentioned earlier that ACEs or adverse childhood experiences are associated with both suicide and opioid abuse. So, you know, doing some kind of program that addresses those kinds of risk factors uh, could be really helpful. Um, if we want to focus on populations at increased risk, the Veterans Administration um, has uh, released a stratification tool for opioid risk mit mitigation. It's, it's called the STORM. And it's, it assesses risk among patients with higher rates of chronic pain, mental health, and substance use disorder. And so because it's sort of um, collectively uh, assessing risk of, you know, kind of all three of these public health problems, um, we're able to kind of direct our prevention efforts, you know, to, to folks um, depending on their level of risk for, for each of these. Um, or, you know, there's the option to address, to select strategies that address both outcomes, suicide and opioid uh, abuse. Um, I think specifically about uh, the good behavior game in elementary school, which is a real uh, prevention uh, opportunity, very upstream uh, work that's being done that has shown some positive effects um, in both fields. Um, there's the coping and support training, which is the CAST. It's more of an indicated uh, population type tool. Um, it's a um, you know, it's a it's a meeting. It's a, a um, um, like a high school intervention where folks kind of meet with uh, kids at risk um, and help them with their coping skills and those kinds of upstream uh, prevention efforts. Um, there's also the zero suicide model um, to identify and, and treat those at risk. Um, it's been applied mostly in, in uh, the suicide realm. Um, it's about connecting folks after they're released from the hospital for a suicide attempt, um, you know, with uh, uh, connections, with you know, in community connections. Um, but it's starting to be applied in, in overdose prevention as well. So, you know, folks who have been seen in a hospital for an overdose, for example, um, are starting to kind of have better connections with their community providers uh, post-release, um, and that's been a really useful model as well. Um, so thinking about how to apply that zero suicide model uh, to opioid abuse as well uh, might be a, might be a, a fruitful area uh, for reducing risk. All right, and so I think this is where I turn it to Nicole um, so she can talk about some implications for practice. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. And um, before I talk about the implications for practice, I did just want to share um, two things I thought of when you were talking on the last slide, um, one of which is that um, we did a webinar at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center last year um, on the topic of um, approaching substance use disorders um, in the zero suicide framework. So what does that look like in a health system um, if you're implementing zero suicide and also want to integrate that with um, identifying risk and um, treatment for substance use disorders. And so um, I definitely encourage you to, to go to the resources area of zerosuicide.com and, and check out that webinar. Um, 
and also in the um, first webinar of the series, we talked a bit about um, the CAST program um, that was mentioned on this last slide. Um, so the coping and support training and how that was used in a high school um, on a tribal, um, in a tribal high school. So I definitely encourage you to check that out as well. Um, we have a success story about that on the SPRC website. Okay, so um, let's hear from you again now. Um, you know, we're about halfway through the webinar here, and um, before we shift into kind of the next topic, what key takeaways did you get from this last section um, regarding overlapping risks? I'm wondering, um, did anything surprise you? Um, and what about these implications for practice here on the screen? Are any of you in a community where there's a special task force or coalition to address suicide and opioids, or um, perhaps there's existing opioid misuse groups and, and suicide prevention groups in your community that could be working together? Um, and so let's just take a look at some of the comments coming up in the chat. Um, Great, yeah, so uh, John pointing out the same elements in the zero suicide model can absolutely be applied to overdose prevention, and um, you know, I definitely agree with that. And um, we'll mention a little bit more about that later on in the webinar, and definitely more in the, um, the webinar we did last year that's on the zero suicide website. Um, and let's see. Um, okay, people sharing some resources, that's great. And you know, keep the, the comments coming here while you're typing. Um, I'm going to kind of move into our next example here of how this can play out into the field. Um, so the reason that we opted to highlight Connecticut here is because of some of the work that they have been doing to build an infrastructure within the state um, where they're really able to address that intersection of overdose and suicide. So. Over the last 10 years, Connecticut has been building up their infrastructure with both their suicide prevention grants and their substance misuse prevention grants to really integrate the substance use, mis oh, sorry. <laughs> substance misuse prevention, the suicide prevention, and then actually their mental health promotion efforts that are happening across the state. And so they've gone beyond just going statewide and have zoomed down into regional levels and looking at integrating the regional boards of health and substance abuse prevention councils. So um, making sure that those are integrated and working together so that there aren't separate entities doing this work and, and really looking to make sure that everyone's kind of on the same page. Um, so this has also allowed them to um, address access to lethal means, both in healthcare areas as well as within universities. So they've been working hard to reduce the stigma against access to naloxone or Narcan and using naloxone to reverse overdoses. They've also been able to spread, um, share the detrimental impact on family and loved ones when suicides are misclassified as opioid overdoses. So kind of like a, a media campaign to um, get some awareness around that. And that was something that really came up as being very important to them. So they landed in this place where um, the more people know and understand, and the more people who are at the table, the better and greater the questions are being asked. So um, you know, this helps the state to better effectively address both the issues and their intersection. The more people you have at the table, the harder the questions are that can get asked sometimes, um, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And so that helps to push us to be clear on where we're going and um, what kinds of things we need to be thinking about. Um, OK, so let's just take a look here in the chat. I see people saying, um, so Joanna saying there's a local prevention agency that works in community and schools doing education, as well as working closely with county coalitions, so getting involved in that county level. We are just starting a suicide prevention program in northern Minnesota. Great. Um, definitely um, seeing suicide prevention happening in schools, especially those with higher risk. And um, you know, we shared a couple of evidence-based programs that um, are a good match for that. 
and um, oh, so this may be someone here from Connecticut. Um, they have a statewide suicide advisory board that meets monthly. Various stakeholders involved, such as clinicians, educators, military and veteran folks, doctors, researchers, representatives from funding sources. So great. So thank you so much um, for sharing that here in the chat. I'm glad that we were able to um, have someone from Connecticut on the line to um, share some of some additional details on that. Okay. So, oh, perfect. And so she shared the website here as well. Um, keeping us moving along here, we're going to kind of zoom in a bit, um, if you will, on one particular group at risk for suicide and um, overdose. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Kristen. Great, thank you, Nicole, um, and also thanks for your comments in the chat. Um, definitely keep them coming, and I, I like to see, um, and this happened in the last webinar as well, you know, folks kind of sharing resources uh, between, you know, one another, because I know you are all doing some really interesting work on the ground, and, and that innovation, you know, I, I mentioned this is, a, this is a new field, and the innovation comes from, from you. Um, you're, you know, you're working on the ground, you're working, uh, you know, and, and, and making the connections, um, and so, you know, we definitely want to share that innovation across agencies. If you're doing something new, if you're doing something exciting, uh, definitely let us know about it and let each other know about it because uh, the field needs it. Um, the field is new and, and, you know, and we need new ideas and, and new energy. Um, so, you know, I love seeing those new collaborations happen. Um, so what I'm going to talk about next, um, as uh, Nicole mentioned, is opioid misuse, overdose, and suicide, um, specifically for folks uh, who are experiencing chronic pain. Um, so what I have here is a just a, a visual, I think, of, of chronic pain as a risk factor um, for a, a variety of, of adverse health outcomes, including uh, mental health disorders like uh, anxiety, substance abuse, depression, um, but also as a risk factor for a suicide, both by um, intentional and unintentional overdose. Um, but you know, I guess I, my my problem with this chart, and I probably should have should have drawn a couple of extra lines um, because, you know, this, this chart sort of makes it look very linear, um, but the experience of chronic pain um, with the, and, and its association with these outcomes is, um, you know, complicated. I think that what we could have is, is a chart where, you know, chronic pain can be worsened by depression or anxiety. Um, we could have a suicide attempt that leads to chronic pain. We have complicated and interrelated relationships here, so it's not as linear as it sort of looks on this chart. Um, and so it kind of want to keep that in mind that, again, these connections are, are really complicated and they all kind of draw back to one another. And, and there's not really a causal relationship here necessarily. Um, there's an association and we're still trying to tease out what the, causal, what the causation direction kind of is. Um, this is a quote that just kind of um, reveals the, you know, seriousness of chronic pain. Um, I'm not living a life now. There are worse things than death. This is a patient with chronic pain um, from pain and suicide, the other side of the opioid story. Um, this uh, kind of reflects the, you know, the experience um, of 100 million Americans who are experiencing chronic pain, uh, 50 million Americans who are experiencing acute pain, an additional 10 million Americans who are experiencing cancer pain, uh, about 160 million uh, Americans experiencing some kind of, uh, of pain, um, you know, during the year. Um, and so it's really important to, to kind of understand that, you know, this is, this is an experience that is, you know, not, not rare. Um, and so, you know, we want to, uh, you know, really advocate for, for having, understanding the relationship between uh, chronic pain, opioid abuse, and suicide, and one that kind of understands the, the chronic pain issue. Um, so, you know, the, the idea that, you know, we simply take higher doses of opioids sort of off the market is not necessarily what we're advocating for. You know, I think that there are lots of solutions um, that, you know, doctors can be educated about, um, including, you know, when and how to use opioids, um, but also when and how to use alternative uh, medicines, you know, other, other kinds of ways of managing uh, chronic pain. And so, you know, really thinking and finding spaces uh, for, for managing that pain because that pain has to be managed. Um, so opioid, if we want to talk first, I want to talk first about opioid misuse and overdose risk in patients with chronic pain, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, suicide um, in patients with chronic pain. We know that chronic pain is associated with an increased risk of opioid abuse and overdose. Um, we've seen that, you know, kind of in, in some earlier slides and in here as well. Um, some of the factors that increase opioid overdose risk among patients with chronic pain include high, higher opioid uh, doses. Again, this refers to doses of more than 50 milligrams uh, per day. Um, you know, I mentioned that earlier, that kind of 50 to 100 milligrams has been studied as, as being a, a space of, of increased risk. 
Um, there's also concurrent prescriptions, so opioids and benzodiazepines specifically, so things like Valium or Xanax uh, can seem to increase uh, opioid risk among patients with chronic pain. Um, if we think about suicide risk in patients with chronic pain, um, we see a couple of factors that are uh, associated with increased suicide risk, including pain severity, uh, pain diagnosis, uh, pain catastrophizing, and perceived burdensomeness. And I want to point to this idea of perceived burdensomeness. Um, if we think about Joyner's um, interpersonal theory of suicide, it's one of the leading theories of, of um, suicide that's, that's out there. Um, it, it posits that you know a person's belief that they are a burden to their loved ones um, is a is a strong issue in in um, you know in, in increasing suicide risk. And so you know for chronic pain patients, um, they may feel like a burden to their loved ones. That in that that burdensomeness feeling uh, puts them at risk for suicide. Some additional factors that increase uh, suicide risk among chronic pain patients um, include insomnia. Insomnia is a well-studied risk factor for suicide. Uh, desire to escape from pain, um, passive coping strategies versus more active coping strategies, um, and prescription opioid uh, use as, as a risk factor as well. Um, and I noticed that uh, stigma is actually not on this list, and I would put it here as well. Uh, people who experience chronic pain deal with stigma, being called a drug seeker, um, being accused of, of seeking some kind of gain for their um, for their symptoms, you know, like uh, like those debates about disability benefits, those kinds of things, um, being called a hypochondriac, you know, these kinds of, um, of stigma-related issues are associated or, or could be associated with suicide risk uh, for patients with chronic pain, um, although that needs to be, I think, better studied. And this is, I think, where I turn it to Nicole to talk about some implications for prevention. Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, I was getting like really involved in the chat here and kind of lost track of where we were. <laughs> it was good to hear my name coming up. Um, so let's take a little step back again to kind of reflect on what we have heard about the risks. And um, you know, please share in the chat any of the key points that have stuck with you from that section. And um, you know, we can get into the um, the kind of practical application a bit here and, and what all of this means for prevention. So um, to begin with, as we often do in public health, right, we're going to take a step back and um, think about doing a community readiness assessment um, to identify what's already happening in our communities. So thinking about things like do we have an advanced pain management clinic nearby and who is the population maybe in our community that's experiencing highest rates of chronic pain or the most chronic pain? And what, that, what might that mean in, in terms of the health disparities that are present? And what about making sure that people have access to effective health care? Um, thinking about these pieces in the context of our own communities is really important. Um, and also important is thinking about which other organizations are around us that may be um, actively addressing chronic pain. So for example, if there's a local labor union um, supporting workers in incredibly physically demanding jobs, is chronic pain on their radar? And how might they be addressing this? What about other local organizations, community centers, faith community, chambers of commerce? How are they thinking about supporting individuals who may be experiencing chronic pain? And who might they be able to bring to the table? So getting that kind of like lay of the land is really important to um, understand what's happening in the community, but also to kind of see how big of an issue chronic pain can be and, and to be able to help support that. So thinking about some additional strategies and resources already being used in our community to address the needs of patients with chronic pain, that could be those um, chronic, uh, sorry, those pain management centers, or um, maybe there's an opportunity to partner if you're in a more rural area on a telehealth opportunity. Um, so seeing if there's some kind of um, ability to partner on that. And thinking about how can our faith communities be a part of engaging more generally in prevention efforts to raise that awareness um, about non-medication strategies among those people who experience pain. So thinking very strategically and practically about what can help, what that can help us do in terms of destigmatizing and creating a bit more compassion 
we want to be engaging in that conversation and over time and, and by talking about these issues and, and talking about the real barriers that chronic pain patients feel and experience, we have an opportunity to challenge community norms around that and some of that um, stigma that um, Kristen talked about. And obviously we're also thinking about how we can partner with medical communities, um, the more obvious partner there to implement or support other strategies to reduce the risk of opioid um, misuse, overdose, and um, suicide amongst those with um, chronic pain. And um, I see lots of um, activity here in the chat, um, which is great, people talking about um, the zero suicide model for overdose prevention. This is great. Um, thank you, John, for sharing um, this information here um, and talking about how critical this um, conversation is around the risk of chronic pain. Okay, um, so now that we have the ideas kind of rolling around about community readiness and taking action, um, I'm going to hand it back now to Kristen to discuss a public health approach to this work and some examples from the field of how that comes out. Sure, and um, actually before I do that too, I just want to take a moment, uh, step back, uh, thank John again for uh, including the uh, adaptation of the zero suicide model for overdose prevention. Um, it's some work that's being done by uh, Verna Little in New York, um, who uh, is, is really kind of coined the term zero overdose, um, and so her and her group, um, John, I'm not sure if you're associated with them, um, are actually working on uh, exactly that adaptation, the kind of the kind of adaptation that John's suggesting here. Um, so I think there's some exciting work uh, that's being done there and some really cool great lessons learned because the zero suicide model is a nice comprehensive public health approach uh, to prevention that is working uh, well in suicide um, to the best of our knowledge as they start to you know kind of comprehensively evaluate it and so I think that it's a model that could work very well for um, for uh, opioid overdose and um, for those of you unfamiliar with the model it really takes a lot of the best practices in um, in suicide prevention including uh, linking people to um, to aftercare, um, taking care of, you know, sort of post-vention kinds of services, um, really making sure that there is sort of no wrong door uh, when folks enter uh, into a healthcare facility um, for suicidal thoughts or ideation or attempts. Um, and so that way, you know, they're receiving the correct uh, screening instruments and really best practices in those areas. Um, and I think there's a lot of lessons learned that can happen for, for zero overdose as well. Um, and zero suicide really takes a um, one of the one of the really big strengths of it is that you know it's focused on this sort of self study so organizations really they examine their capacity to deal with the issue of suicide um, you know as a health system and then they kind of figure out where their weaknesses are and they use data to really inform their their efforts uh, to build up their system and I just think it's a real fabulous uh, way of of um, you know, kind of uh, uh, preventing suicide. Um, I think it could be very, very useful for opioid overdose as well. Uh, Nicole has uh, pointed out where you can access the Zero Suicide webinar on uh, substance use disorders, uh, where uh, the Zero Overdose model is, is actually presented. It's a, a resource uh, from FPRC, uh, which is the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, which is actually where uh, Nicole and I are from. Um, we also wanted to point to um, one of the points that Nicole made about engaging non-traditional partners um, when we're thinking about um, you know, prevention, I, I think, you know, the, the connection between chronic pain, opioid abuse, and, and um, overdose and suicide, um, that those non-traditional partners who may be experiencing chronic pain, like those in the construction industry um, who have really demanding, physically demanding jobs, um, are maybe those same folks who are at risk for suicide. We know, for example, that certain industries are at higher risk of suicide than others. Um, so uh, folks who work in the construction industry, folks who work in forestry, who work in law enforcement, the military, um, these folks have physically demanding jobs um, and they may be experiencing chronic pain as a result. So that, that complicated relationship may be particularly present uh, for these kinds of industries, and so it may be important to start to think about how we engage non-traditional partners um, who may be at risk for chronic pain and suicide um, in our prevention efforts. All right, so now I'm going to move on to talk about the public health approach. Um, and you know, I, I am, and you know, as has probably been evident throughout this uh, webinar series, a big advocate for the public health approach to prevention. Um, what we need to lower the rates of opioid overdose and suicide death in this country is a comprehensive approach to prevention that has national level buy-in. Um, 
you know, if you recall in the first webinar, I talked a lot about motor vehicle um, accidents and how in the 1990s and early 2000s, we made a real concentrated effort to decreasing motor vehicle deaths um, by, you know, increasing the safety technology in our vehicles, by working on um, child safety restraints, by enacting new legislation and, and, and laws about drinking and driving and really, you know, decreasing the acceptability of drinking and driving, that, that sort of social norms around that, um, all of those efforts that nice comprehensive approach um, really kind of coming at the problem from multiple angles uh, really made an, a, a nice, you know, a nice decrease, I think, in, in motor vehicle deaths. And, and we saw it. We saw it in the, you know, kind of mid-2000, like around 2010 or so, we started to see a decrease in, in motor vehicle deaths. And I really think that if we took that same kind of approach to opioid overdose and suicide, um, we could start to see some nice impacts there as well, particularly, I think, because um, opioid overdose and suicide share a lot of similar risk factors as we've talked about throughout this series. And so it gives us a real nice opportunity, I think, to, to really get at, you know, two different public health problems um, in, in one space. And so um, I think there's some, some nice, you know, savings there, too, um, both in terms of lives saved, economics, you know, in terms of, like, our prevention efforts. We're directing our prevention efforts. We're coordinated. It's a comprehensive approach. We could see some, some change. Sorry about my soapbox. That's my, my public health approach to prevention hat. I just uh, <laughs> can't seem to take that one off. Um, what is a public health approach to prevention? Um, it is a, a population focus. Um, it starts with and ends with data. Um, it involves upstream and downstream prevention efforts with the aim of reducing morbidity and mortality. So it's a systematic um, effort. It's data informed. So it really starts with data. So, you know, we look at data to see where the problem is, what are those shared risk and protective factors, you know, um, how can we kind of start to think about, um, you know, kind of attacking this problem? What non-traditional partners should we engage in, in, and have at the table? Um, and then there's a space where we develop and test prevention strategies. So, you know, we think about what works. We use evidence-based programming and, and interventions and strategies, uh, you know, environmental strategies to create change. Um, and we use things that work and we test them. Um, and, and so before they go widespread, we really test them. We, we evaluate them and we make sure that they're working. Um, and, then pro and then we ensure kind of widespread adoption. We, we, we make it go, you know, sort of nationwide at that point. And so that's really the public health approach to prevention. We start with data. We identify those risk and protective factors. We use things that work, and then we adopt them more in a more widespread way. I'm going to give you some examples of, of spaces and, and places that are really taking this kind of approach to prevention. Um, the first is the Colorado National Collaborative. It's kind of tackling um, opioid overdose and suicide simultaneously. Um, its focus is mainly on suicide prevention, but um, because of those shared risk and protective factors, it's, it's tackling opioid um, overdose as well. Um, it's a public health approach that has the goal of reducing suicide by 20% by 2024, again, also tackling opioid overdose and other causes of premature mortality. Um, what it, they've done so far with the Colorado National Collaborative is to use a public-facing dashboard that allows for a county-level analysis of who is at risk by, of death, for death by suicide. So it draws on data from um, the National Violent Death Reporting System um, that I had presented earlier. Um, it's, it's drawing on those, those circumstances surrounding the death. So, you know, folks who have died by suicide, what industry did they work in? And, you know, what, um, you know, did they have a substance use problem, a known substance use problem prior to their death? What systems did they touch prior to their death? Um, and it, and it, it allows counties to manipulate the data. So if you're living in Colorado right now, you actually have access to this public-facing dashboard, and we can get you the link um, as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's allowing folks to really um, manipulate the data so that way they can see in their county who specifically is at risk. And um, in doing so, they also do this sort of environmental scan so they can identify existing activities um, related to things like increasing social connectedness, increasing help seeking, promoting evidence-based treatment. So they, they do this sort of broad scale environmental scan. They see what activities are already happening and then they kind of map that onto who's at risk. And what we can do when we, when we do that together, those two things together, is we can see, okay, well, these are the folks who are at risk. What prevention strategies are happening to try to, you know, kind of uh, address the, the risk that, you know, that the, the, the folks at highest risk are experiencing? You know, do we have anything directed to men in the middle years if those are the folks at highest risk? Or do we have, you know, what are our prevention efforts in this county look like related to veterans, for example, if those are the folks at highest risk? Um, it really kind of, you know, takes prevention efforts and, and targets them uh, to the folks who, are, who can be at highest risk uh, 
allowed to really, you know, start to decrease the numbers in that county. Um, so again, it's just looking at those gaps, who's at risk and who's being missed by the current programming. How can we fill those gaps? What partners do we need at the table? Who's present and who's missing? Um, you know, that's what the Colorado Collaborative is seeking to do. It's really taking a public health approach to prevention because it is starting with data. Um, but it's also taking a public health approach to prevention because all of the strategies that are being recommended by the Colorado National Collaborative are evidence-based strategies. So they're creating a list of different things that counties should and can do to participate in the Colorado National Collaborative to decrease their, their county's risk. Um, and, you know, there are different pillars that are associated um, with uh, different types of, of strategies. So, you know, there's a, there's a pillar on decreasing access to lethal means. There's a pillar on um, increasing social connectedness, a pillar on, you know, promoting um, good training uh, pillar on uh, making sure that, you know, uh, uh, health systems are really engaged in zero suicide type model and, and really um, suicide safer care. Um, and so, you know, it, it's taking this, this, like I said, public health approach to prevention, which is a, a really powerful approach. Um, and Nicole, thank you very much. She has put some information on the Colorado data dashboard and, and linked it in the chat. Um, another example of a uh, group that's doing a public health uh, approach to prevention is the uh, Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition uh, that, again, examines data to look at who is at risk for premature death, uh, particularly from opioid overdoses. Uh, what they did was identified and publicized existing services to make sure that folks knew what was already happening in the county and they could, you know, kind of take advantage of the things that were already, you know, occurring. Um, and then they plan some upstream prevention services that um, could reduce both suicide and opioid overdose. They're so really taking advantage of programs that, you know, kind of tackle both problems. And finally, there's Project Lazarus um, in North Carolina. Um, this project is really about prescriber education, uh, which can be really useful in reducing both suicide and opioid misuse and overdose. Um, it was all about uh, managing uh, chronic pain in outpatient settings and really safe prescribing practices, so making sure that uh, prescribers were really uh, familiar with how to address chronic pain um, through both opioid medications and in other ways as well. And I am going to pass it to Nicole, who can talk a little bit about how we can use this information. Great. Thanks so much. Um, and, you know, I think we've had a lot of really great information today. And, you know, maybe we might be feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Um, and so <laughs> now we're going to get a little bit further into actions that we can take um, as community members, as individuals, and um, healthcare providers. I know we have some treatment folks in the audience today. so. Um, you know, I'd love to see in the chat if anyone is doing any of these suggested actions and, you know, any successes maybe that you've seen um, as a result. Okay, so what are some kind of general themes of what health systems can do to address populations at risk? We're talking about avoiding the gaps in care that can lead to people, quote unquote, falling through the cracks, um, creating protective environments for persons in care and connecting people with resources in their community to kind of begin to build out that protective environment outside of the health system. Getting a little bit more specific here, making sure that providers are screening for both suicide risk and opioid overdose risk using evidence-based tools. Um, and in that um, webinar that I put in the chat, the Substance Use Disorders and the Zero Suicide Framework, they do actually talk um, about what some of those evidence-based tools are. Also, again, making sure that persons in care have smooth care transitions between settings and that there's a safety plan in place to address what the person can do if they are feeling suicidal or if they're considering using opioids. And often this becomes kind of like a suicide and relapse prevention plan or almost like a harm reduction plan at times. When appropriate, providers are including non-medication strategies for pain management and, and maybe advocating to the person's insurance company for coverage of those services when appropriate as well. Making sure that if your healthcare organization offers, say, like free yoga classes to the community or something like that, um, make sure that you're engaging with your partners in the community and, and getting that word out. Um, these are just kind of like a few ways, really, that health systems can begin to think about addressing this issue. <laughs> 
So um, what role at the community and individual level can you play um, in supporting people at risk for opioid misuse or overdose and suicide? So some themes here around building resilience, teaching coping skills, identifying people at risk, these things will help prevent uh, future risk. And, and so let's get a little bit more specific on those themes. So from a community prevention practitioner perspective, we know how important collaboration is. And when it comes to this issue, it's just as important. Um, you want to think outside the box. Are there partners that you aren't engaged with that you could reach out to? Um, maybe local pharmacies or um, other businesses. And we have lots of great resources um, for community outreach. And you know, I can make sure we share some of those in the chat. Um, the Action Alliance website has um, some resources related to this that can be helpful from a community-based prevention perspective. And finally, these resources here are crucial to helping persons at risk for suicide get the help that they need. Um, additionally, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, as we discussed in our last webinar, has many resources focused on collaboration as well. Um, so it's a great place to find um, you know, templates for letters maybe that you want to write to partners or um, ways of kind of identifying priorities across your collaboration. So um, with that, um, I believe I'm going to turn it over now to uh, either Ann or Chuck for our Q&A section. Um, so I will turn it over to you. Hi, this is Ann. We're just going to go through um, some of the questions. Um, a couple were um, determining suicide versus accidental overdose, which I know that we already covered. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any other additional information that you needed um, or wanted to add. Um, this is Kristen, and um, I will add that I think there's some interesting research um, being done on this issue. Um, I'm thinking about some issue, some um, research that's being done by Nate Wright, who's an epidemiologist out in Minnesota, um, who actually was exploring the issue of undercounting. Um, I know there's an interest in the room in, in Native American populations, and he specifically was interested in the rates of undercounting um, of suicide, um, you know, and opioid overdoses um, among Native American populations. And he did um, these really in-depth uh, forensic interviews of folks who had died uh, by suicide um, uh, who were Native American uh, and, and it was classified as an opioid overdose. And he checked to see, you know, was this an opioid overdose, you know, for sure? Um, was this a possible, you know, um, um, uh, miscoding. Um, and so he found that um, among folks in Minnesota, among uh, Native American individuals in, in Minnesota, uh, the, the rate of possible undercounting was about 28 percent. So this undercounting rate is, is not insubstantial. Um, there, you know, there is likely, you know, a, a bit of it happening. Um, and so, you know, it's important to kind of think about how that might impact our, our prevention efforts. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next is um, question is, we'd be curious to learn more about um, successfully working with the medical examiner at the local level um, to determine accidental versus intentional. And I know we, again, addressed that as well. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any additional information. Yeah, we did touch on that, but I will, you know, I'll just encourage folks, I think, to to kind of get creative. Again, we've talked a lot about non-traditional partners and coroners and medical examiners might be folks that, you know, are not at the table um, for your suicide prevention efforts um, or, or maybe even your opioid overdose prevention efforts, but, you know, possibly should be um, because those, you know, those areas of education I think are really critically important and making sure that they understand uh, why uh, their, their death determination makes a difference um, in terms of your prevention efforts, uh, you know, might be, a, might be a good start. Um, so they might be a good partner to, to draw in. Great. Um, the last question that I have is, is there a correlation between cutting or self-harming and suicide in young adults or teens? 
Yeah, so, um, you know, I think when we think about cutting self-harming, so we're talking about non-suicidal self-injury, also called NSSI. We see it in the literature a lot. Um, I think that, you know, when we're talking about NSSI, um, what we have is some intention difficulties again. You know, sometimes, you know, folks who are uh, self-harming are unable to really articulate why. Um, and so if it's an actual suicide attempt or versus a self-harm, um, I think that also in the, in the you know, hospitals, so in our data, that we get from the hospitals, um, you know, it's, it's really up to physicians um, and up to the reports of those who are, you know, seeking help uh, to, to really articulate their intentions and, and, you know, for that to be spelled out. Um, and so, again, we run into some data difficulties. Um, but we, what we do know is that there are um, shared risk factors, I think, between um, non-suicidal self-injury, NSSI, and um, and uh, suicide attempts, um, and so it's important as we think about our prevention efforts to think about some of those shared risk factors, some of which might be, be things like social isolation um, or um, adverse childhood experiences. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a space in prevention for, you know, kind of addressing both simultaneously as we've been talking about throughout this webinar, just thinking about public health problems that have shared risk and protective factors moving upstream and thinking about how we can, how we can address them together. Um, we do differentiate between those two in the literature the best we can, though. Great. Um, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions. Is there any uh, information or any? We will. I just want to again let people know that um, if you need a certificate of participation, it'll probably be two to three weeks. Um, we'll get it out to people. And um, this webinar, as well as the first webinar, in fact, all of our webinars, will be um, posted to the um, Great Lakes Prevention Technology Transfer Center website. And that takes us a couple of weeks as well. But if it doesn't look like there's any additional questions, um, I would like to thank our presenters today, as well as all of you who logged on for this really great webinar. So thank you. <laughs>